Okay. So, good morning. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the recording will not show who is here. I'm speaking to tens of thousands of people, potentially. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, each of you is a world of your own. That's what the Mishnah says. Every human being is an entire universe. So, the exact title is, uh, I believe, well, something like, how does God, a good God, allow, the age-old question, allow good people to suffer? Which is really the big question, why is there suffering in this world? And, uh, I hope none of you have ever really suffered, but I have spoken to audiences where to deal with a lot of, I remember it was once in uh, Johannesburg, actually South Africa. So it was a, a week, a tour over an entire week. So one talk they dedicated, they had, there were some tragedies, had, their parents had lost some children, different incidents that had happened. And there was others, so they dedicated one of the talks in one of the synagogues to this topic. It was open to everybody, but the people that attended were all, obviously, people who went through a real tragedy. Um, being that I don't know what, you know what's going on in your lives, I'm not going to assume anything. But I remember it was extremely, especially for me, it was difficult to give the talk. Not because I have nothing to say, but because... The real truth is that the question is not an intellectual question, let's be honest. This isn't a philosophical uh, discussion. A person who suffered, a person who's been hurt in any way, um, is emotionally bleeding. And to put it in very simple terms, a, uh, the most brilliant mind cannot speak to a bleeding heart. That's how it is. And anyone that thinks differently is just either naive or, or out of touch, or immature. And uh, for me, this was always the big dilemma, because yes, there's things we can say. There are books that talk about, we have an entire book of Job that talks about a man who suffers and speaks to God about it. And I will quote some things, but I can't find my, I can't, my good conscience, begin a conversation on this topic without first this big disclaimer. Because, um, and those just the, what's that noise out there? That, uh, what's the swinging noise? It's, a, it's a, just something that can be... Can you look what it is? Maybe just put something that will stop it, or maybe not. It's fine. Just stopped. Oh, no. No, I think it's something like something moving, something. Yeah. Okay, if, if it can't be done, anything about done about it, leave it alone. It's all right. And then it started again. Didn't really stop. Okay. It's fine. Don't make a cry unless it's easy to... Do you know what it is? Okay. Fine. I'll just wait since... It's fine, fine, let's move on. Just a, a little annoying, okay. We'll focus on you, not on the yeah. Um. So it brings to mind a story, which I think captures this well. <laughs> now everybody's going to notice it, right? <laughs> okay, what should I tell you? It's like tinnitus. You know, any of you have tinnitus? You know that uh, sound in your ear? Uh, sure not. Thank God. Okay. So it brings to mind a story that there was a uh, uh, a Rosh Yeshiva, a head of a of a yeshiva, a very great scholar, well respected, and unfortunately, a tragedy struck. So though he had all the blessings in his life, he had a beautiful family, and he had a community, but. They were out. They were at sea. They were traveling, and the ship capsized, 
and his entire family was lost. Now, nobody wanted to share this news with him. Horrible news. So, but they needed to tell him. So they decided the lucky one will be his uh, favorite student. They said to the student of his, you have to figure out a way to tell this great rabbi that a terrible thing happened in his life. Now he didn't either want, who, who wants to share such a story, such news with someone that you love? But then he came up with an idea. He came into the base medrash, to the, into the academy, into the study hall, and he opens up a Talmud, Masech de Brachas, to a certain page, and he says, Rebbe, my, my dear teacher, I have a, a statement here in the Talmud that I can't figure out. And what did it say there? It said that just as a person has to thank God for their blessings, you also have to thank God for the opposite of blessings. That's how he began. He didn't tell him anything what happened. Can you explain this to me? How could you equate tragedy to blessing? So his teacher, who was a brilliant man, got into a whole discussion. He said, we don't understand God's ways, the mystery of life and death. But there's always a bigger plan. But the student would not relent. So he said, but still, how could you compare the two? So he went into another discussion that everything negative brings to something positive. You know, there's the whole slew of explanations that you hear that every pain will lead to greater growth. The student again rejected that. And then finally he says to his teacher, so are you telling me that a person who loses a family in a tragedy has to dance just as if they were celebrating their children's weddings? So the teacher said, it's hard to understand, but yes, that's what you have to do. So he said, Rebbe, my dear teacher, you can start dancing. And he told him what happened. So instead of dancing, you can imagine he fainted. And when they revived him, the teacher said, the great teacher said, now suddenly I don't understand this whole Talmud either. In other words, it's one thing when you're talking about it abstract, it's not connected to you. So you could have come up with all kinds of theories. It's very different when it happens. So to me, this has always been, and you can imagine over my years, my work, I, I, I don't even want to mention how many tragedies and suffering. I mean, I just had to deal with a family that the daughter committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're talking horrible stuff. I don't even want to say it, but I, I want to say it because I want to talk about this topic. And it's extremely, for me it's difficult because I start with empathy. I don't start with philosophy. To me it's about caring. And what do you say? The truth is, that you must admit that we really have nothing to say, to be honest. So it's not a surprise that when Aaron, the high priest in the Torah, it talks about how when his two children died prematurely, when they went into the temple, we read it, we'll be reading it these week's chapters. Nadav and Naviyu, they went into the temple and they, they died there. So what it says, Vayidaim Aaron, that Aaron was silenced. That's the word. I find that to be the, the true response, silence. You go into a shiva call, for example, Chamon al you should never know of any tragedies. There are people there talking, 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 you know, they think they're saying all kinds of smart things. Maybe silence. Who says you have to say something? You know, the wisdom of the silence is that there are certain things that are, cannot be uh, fathomed and explain in words. Silence is not uh, surrender or um, resignation. It's maybe the best way to recognize that something is beyond you. And you see it again in the story, the famous story, we say Yom Kippur, the 10 martyrs, Rabbi Akiva and nine others, when the Roman emperor decides in his cruelty, wants to punish them, and he puts them to brutal, brutal type of death. And they say, Moses and the angels, the Talmud says, come to God and say, this is Torah and this is its reward. You're greatest people. 
And we can ask exactly the same question with the Holocaust. Not getting into the level of each person, but such beautiful people. One and a half million innocent children. I mean, who doesn't have this question? You have to be completely, completely uh, callous to not have the question, how could such a thing happen? And what does God respond to, the, to Moses and to the angels? He says, Stoik. That's what he says. Again, silent. Be silent. This is what arose in my thought and my will. And if you continue, he actually says something more. He says, I'll destroy the entire universe. Which itself needs explanation. What does that mean? You, you did enough damage, now you're going to destroy the universe because we're asking a, a fair, legitimate question. I'll get back to that a little bit later, that answer. <coughs> but the silence part is what I wanted to focus on first. So before anything is said on this topic, and I say this to myself, to yourselves, if you ever have to, if you ever have to deal with anyone, don't ever think that you have to find explanations. Silence is a far stronger and better response. You know, hold someone's hand. One of the Rebbes once said, I don't have answers for you, he told someone who suffered a tragedy, but I can cry with you. Cry with someone, by all means. I'm here with you. But don't think you have to always have an answer. Because answers are limited. And they're never going to be a complete answer. I think it was the old Belzer Rebbe that said, after the Holocaust, and they said, he said, even if God wanted to come and explain to me why it happened, I don't want to hear. I want an explanation also. The tragedy was bad enough. I need now a, uh, a justification. He, didn't want to, he wouldn't even want to hear it. And it's a very profound uh, reaction. Because not looking for answers. The problem is we live in a world where sometimes the mind is overrated. And we think everything has to be analyzed and dissected and proven or disproven. Yes, there are many things, mathematical equations and other many things that need empirical type of proofs. But there's a whole area of life that is not exactly about rational thinking. It's not so irrational, but this is recognizing in a very um, humble way that there's something greater than ourselves. You know, I might as well go back to the story with God saying he'll destroy the universe. So I once heard a, a very powerful explanation and then I'll continue where I was at. You know, and what does that mean that God said he'll destroy the universe? Well, you know, it can't be challenged. God can't be challenged about something that seems inappropriate. You know, innocent people. You know, you read how they were killed. It's, like, it's like horrendous. So I heard the, the analogy given of uh, a story with a tailor, a world famous tailor, who was once commissioned by a great king to weave and, 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 and uh, a beautiful, beautiful garment for the king. But not just a garment. One that would have many layers that reflect the royalty and the beauty of the kingship. And it took him a few years to do so. And uh, it was a very expensive garment. Now the end here is not like the emperor with no clothes. That's another <laughs> story. You know that one? Right. This has a different ending. And it was very expensive. And then finally the garment was brought to the king. Some of the skeptics said to the king, it's a beautiful garment, but, you know, let's not overdo it. And some of them actually felt they want to replicate it, you know, for such a great garment. So they, so they decided, they convinced the king what they're going to do is they're going to um, unweave like remove all the, how do you say it, uh, when you, uh, un after all the, the knitting and the weaving and the sewing, they're going to un unblend, undo, undo it all, unravel. Uh, unravel it all, to see how the garment was made. And then they could see, is there a real secret here or is it just a con artist? And of course, once they did that, they no longer could put it back together again because they didn't have that mastery because he was a true artist. It would be like taking a, a Rembrandt and deconstructing, that's the word I was looking for, deconstructing it, and then try to put it back together again. You know, it may sound simple, I'll just take it apart and so on. So the analogy is given that God created the universe in a way like that, with that type of masterful touch, that we don't understand most of it. 
So God wasn't saying as a punishment, I'm going to destroy the universe. If you insist on understanding why I created a world where there can be such suffering, the whole garment will fall apart. It's part of a bigger story. And just remember that, that you may not understand it because you're not God. So this is not a justification for pain and suffering. It's just understanding that there's more to the picture than we will perhaps ever know. So I want to go a little deeper into this. After this uh, so-called, it's not really an introduction. I think it's the first step in any dealing with any painful situation. Is the empathy, the silence, the recognition that we're all vulnerable and we don't have the answers to the big questions. And that to me is an answer. That's not evasive. It's not like, oh, okay, let's move on. That is the only legitimate answer because you're dealing with something that's beyond our scope. So, <clears throat> so in that context, when Eiv, Job, asks God that big question, why do good people suffer? So there's one phrase, I'm going to paraphrase it, <coughs> where Hashem, God, responds to him the following. I find that to be, and I can tell you, when I, for me, maybe my most traumatic event in my life, and thank God, I must acknowledge and admit full transparency, I have not suffered greatly. I have nothing close to what I've seen in my life by others. But everybody has their trauma. My biggest traumatic event was my father's death 16 years ago, almost 16 years ago. He was almost 70 years old. You know, I was the first time I experienced death firsthand my own family. You know, father. I love my father. And as a child, you're connected to your father more than you ever know because he was holding your hand long before your memory even remembered. It's part of who you are. And it was, a, it was a very, I mean, I'll never forget what, what that experience. I don't have the shock right now and all of that. But every yisker and every time we talk about it, it's very easy for me to recollect that, that experience. I remember of the, during the shiva calls, the only thing I remember among all the geniuses that were trying to explain things was one person saying to me, remember when you lose someone in your life, it's like a hole in your chest, like a hole in your heart. Or think of it like a hole in your living room. And you keep falling into it. And one day, what happens is, the hole doesn't go away. You just learn to walk around it. And that remained with me. Because it was the only thing that was just sensible. It also gave me strength. So, I remember reading the book of Job. Eov is the classic sufferer. You all know the story probably, how he was all blessed with so many good things and he was a very righteous, pious man. But then the angels in heaven said, okay, he's pious because you've blessed him. He's prosperous, he has a family, he's healthy, he's successful, he has, he's, he's respected. Take all that away from him, let's see what happens. And that's what happens. Some say the book of Job is a metaphor that never actually, there was no man like that. Some say there was a person like that. Regardless, the lessons are very powerful. But there's one exchange between him and God that always really resonates with me. And I hope it resonates with you too. It's in the same context. Where he says to God, you know, why, why, why would you allow good people to suffer? And wicked people to prosper for that matter. And I'm paraphrasing, but God says to him, were you there when I created heaven and earth that you asked me this question? You know, you're like talking to me like you're my partner, so to speak. And you want to know why I'm allowing this. Were you there when I created it all? In different language, God is saying to him, you ask me why there's suffering. You ask me why there's joy. You ask me why there's death. Do You ask me why there's life. It's all tied together. If I hadn't created existence, you wouldn't have suffering. You also wouldn't have pain and you wouldn't have joy and celebrations. But you don't ask that question. You're not asking me why I created the world. You're asking me why is there pain in the world. In other words, you're coming after the fact that I built this beautiful world and now you're asking me that. Why does I tell you why it resonates with me? Because it acknowledges, number one, that God is not going to go and get into a philosophical discussion with him about something that first thing you need to know, why did God put the world in this world? Why did he create such a world? Why did he create a world where it's possible there should be pain? Let's not talk about actual suffering possibility. 
Because remember, there's no possibility for suffering, there'd be no suffering. So that has to get into a deeper understanding, why is there life? Why did create God a world like this, where people can hurt each other, and people will die, and people will suffer, there'll be disease and illness and all the pains that we see. You know, I met recently a person who used to come to my classes, and then he wrote me a letter that he no longer can come to any classes. Extremely, basically, he's given up on God. The reason he tells me why is because his father is suffering from Alzheimer's. And he sees his father, who is a very intelligent, respectable human being, so deteriorating in front of his eyes. He says, I can understand if God killed him, if he dies. That I would be able to deal with. But why keep him here on this earth? And it has to be a person who loses his entire dignity doesn't remember, you know, everything that comes with Alzheimer's. What do you say to a person like this? You know, obviously, I'm not going to speak on behalf of God. It's a very good question. You know, you want to, someone should be dead, let them let, kill them. Or let them die, God forbid. But why put someone... And what about when you see a child born <coughs> without even a chance, either through the mental handicap or, or emotional <coughs> issues... That, and, and that person simply will never have a chance to be able to make decisions in the normal sense of the word. You know, I remember when my sister gave birth, her eighth child, <clears throat> to a Down syndrome child. And many people, it, it, it's devastating. Um, and it was devastating to them, and they cried many nights. But then I saw them rise to the occasion. They named her Brocha. Bracha means a blessing. And it wasn't just a, a cute uh, euphemism. They named her Bracha because they felt that she was a blessing. And not only did they accept her, they celebrate her. I remember they would bring her, their, their daughter, and she was clearly Down syndrome, to a wedding. And my other aunts and uncles were so awkward and uncomfortable, and they'd say, hey, hold our Bracha. My sister had this, she wasn't trying to put them in their place. She was just trying to really embrace a child. And yes, we don't know the mystery of why God consented such a child, but it's my child. And she, the whole family, instead of being ashamed and embarrassed and hiding the child, they all embraced her as well. And I saw a life, which of course I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but my sister's family became refined and elevated in ways I couldn't even imagine. And I, I want to say it again. I don't wish it on anyone. But I saw how they behaved. So when you start looking at all these things, what, what, is, what, do you, what does it to really tell us? So the first thing, let me just sum up what I said. That to find, try to find an answer, I am not even going to go there. I have no assumptions of such nature uh, to explain why certain things happen. And even if you can explain something, you can say, why did it happen to this person, not this person? How are you going to explain that one? Why the Holocaust? I mean, my blood boils just like your blood boils when I hear what was done. I think about it in the worst, the worst possible nightmare. You know, if I was there with my family, my children, grandchildren who are here now Pesach, where would we be 80 years ago? Where would our children be taken? You know, I don't like to articulate it, but I'm saying it because I want to say it very deliberately. I can't have an answer for that. That's like, I mean, it's, it's beyond words. And yet you see that people came out of that horror and rebuilt something. They didn't forget. Anyone I've seen who's had a Holocaust didn't like forget and say, okay, I'm gonna build a big business now, I'm gonna have a new family. How could you forget? You never forget. You don't even forget the loss of, like I said, I don't even forget the loss of my father in natural circumstances, let alone in such uh, inhumane. The answer is that there's some mysterious um, silence that gives us strength and in turn it allows us to move forward so it brings me to something that I want to move this one I don't want to just talk about the silence I want to talk more than that I just felt I can't begin talking about this topic without first acknowledging that. so I read a letter once it's a letter from the Lubavitch Rebbe to a doctor who clearly was a, lost his family in brothers and sisters and parents in the Holocaust. And the doctor asked the big question, why? Why? Question mark. And the Rebbe responds to him the following. He says, 
we don't know why. But we have to learn how to ask the question, what are we going to do about it? Not why it happened, but what are we going to do about it? Because a victim asked the question why. Why simply means, I don't know why, and therefore I'm, I'm de- demoralized or debilitated. But you ask, what are you going to do about it? That will allow you to gather, to gather, to gather the strength and to gather deeper resources. I wish my wife was here, to be honest. I'll tell you why. She lost her mother at seven years old. I can't even imagine such a thing. Her mother, she lost to leukemia, 37-year-old woman, had five children. My wife was the youngest of five. She lost her. So my wife basically never had a mother. She spoke yesterday, right? I don't know if she spoke about this at all. Okay, but, and I've seen people who've lost family members and their lives are destroyed. I deal with it every day. Drug addicts, people who are in in very sexually unhealthy situations, looking for all ways to relieve themselves of their pain in unhealthy ways. And I look at my wife's family and I see unbelievable strength, unbelievable uh, refinement. And what, they suffered less? No. But they had something, they had, in one of one, what formula, what did they have that others don't have? And I see it came down to this point. They never asked why it happened. They asked what they're gonna do about it. They were not allowing themselves to become victims. My, my wife always tells me how a grandmother who survived her daughter would say, Yom Tov is coming, we're gonna buy new beautiful clothing. They always maintained a type of majestic approach to themselves. They never looked at themselves. You know, we're, we're, we're uh, failures, or we need Rachmanus. It was embracing that we have to dig deeper and become greater people. And my wife and her family, children, she, I mean, she was four, the youngest of five. The oldest was 16 or 17 years old. 16 to 7 years old. And that's what they grew up with. A family that came together and demonstrated that type of strength. And there was no sitting around and moping and just complaining. Of course they cried. My wife always tells me every year the yard site, which was the second day of Sukkot, believe it or not, when my, my wife's mother passed away. She says my grandmother would go into her room and it was horrendous. She would, sh- you know, cry, shriek. They all knew they went, they left the house that day. So they didn't want to be there when that happened. But then the rest of the, she came out of her room and she was as strong as ever. You know, she had lost her husband in Russia to hunger and many tragedies this family went through. I, as I said before, I did not go through any of this. Thank God. But I learned from people and I see where the key was the end of the day. What Hashem said to Eve was not a cop out. You weren't there when I created the world. He was telling him, I created the world with a very deep purpose. And it's so deep that I'm ready to accept the possibility of human suffering because the benefits that you will get through this life are greater than the suffering. And you're going to have to discover that sometimes in difficult ways. So it's not an answer why they're suffering, but in some way explained by the fact that there would be no suffering if there was no independence and there was no life. So really, it comes down to two options you have. Someone suffers and they say, okay, is this life worth living? You know, and the rest of your life you can become... The extracurricular sounds have been great, right? (laughs) But we managed. This is nothing compared to real suffering. Maybe that's the lesson. (laughs) But let... Okay, a little light moment in the middle of this dark topic. (laughs) But the point I want to make is that that th- that this is an answer, the ultimate answer. And that is that we have been given the blessing of life. God in his mysterious way chose to create us, to put us in this world. There's potential for suffering, but the, that, that comes hand in hand with potential for great growth. And when you look at the bigger picture, the bigger picture, not the immediate picture, and you see the people that came out stronger, in the words of Viktor Frankl, a man searched for meaning. He said what he observed, that they didn't suffer less, but the people that had meaning and purpose 
had an extra edge. And the extra edge was something that we, our lives are more than just what we see and think and feel. So I don't want to leave anyone here with the illusion that I'm coming here to answer the big question. At the same time, I want to tell you, I do find this answer to be acceptable to me and to others who have suffered. Um, again, I not, I've suffered, but I mean others that really suffered because I see it time and again. All the people that get through it and become stronger people, the why does not haunt them. They keep asking only one thing, what am I going to do about it? They don't allow themselves to become a victim of circumstances. It's like saying, I've suffered, but I'm not going to be a sufferer. I've uh, experienced negative things, but I'm not going to be defined by my experiences. And people like that are worthy of being around because these are the people you want to be with because they're not, they never scapegoat on others. They don't blame others. They don't look for excuses. They look at things very straight and honest, and completely vulnerable, completely naked in front of God and at the same time becomes much greater and stronger people. So... In some, there's really two sides to this. One is recognizing something's beyond us, and the other is recognizing that there's greater strengths within us that emerge, that emerge. And then when they do emerge, I want to tell you what happened in South Africa after I gave my talk there, which is similar ideas. And I said, we don't know why, but what happened, what, what, uh, what we do about it. A woman got up, she had lost her child a few months earlier, maybe, no more than a few months, she said something like eight or nine months. And she said to me, I disagree with you, Rabbi. I do know why. I've come to realize why. And she didn't explain. So I said to her, of course. I said, look, I'm telling you what I, how I see it. If you come to that conclusion and you have resolution with that, I'm never going to argue with someone that went through a fire. But at the end of the day, I saw, see, her why was a result because she knew what to do about it. So then her growth that came out of it was ultimately her reason for it. Now again, I don't want to use it as justification because I don't really see it that way. But obviously every person who goes through this goes through it. I want to say one more critical point. Many people think that faith, and this is a complete stereotype, that faith is a, is a sign of weakness. Now you know, when you have no answers, you say, okay, I believe in God. I can't tell you how many people have told me, skeptics and these intellectuals, Okay, faith, faith is for the weak-hearted, for the people who are, want a crutch. That's the word, a crutch. So I remember I was once on a radio program. It was a radio interview. And the guy that was interviewing me, I could see, was one of these cynics. And he was, I could see, I could tell from what he was saying. And he was like asking me these condescending questions. And I did a lot of radio, so I knew how to put him in his place, and I did. So he says to me, so tell me, Rabbi, do you ever have a crisis of faith? This was a big question. Do I ever have a crisis of faith? Okay, so I said to him, yeah, every second of my life I have a crisis of faith. You know why? Because when I see a God that I believe in who's good allows suffering, how could you not have a crisis of faith? So he was taken a bit aback because he didn't think I would say something like that. I said, what about you? He says, I have no faith. I have no God. You know, that's what he said to me. So I said, so let me ask you, are you bothered by the fact that an innocent child is, let's say, hit by a car? Or a child is born with terrible mental, mental uh, handicaps? He says, of course it bothers me. I said, why? Who says there's justice in this world? Maybe survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest. And that goes too bad, you know? When a predator is hungry, they go run for the, they go pursue prey. The prey is weak, too bad, and that's it. Why, do you, why does it bother you? Why do you expect justice? Why do you expect that young, innocent children shouldn't be hurt? Why do you expect that good people shouldn't suffer? So he says, because, you know, he didn't, have really an, he didn't have an answer. So I say, you think that faith is a, is a crutch. It's easy to have faith. Why? Why? Because you don't have an answer. You just say, it's God. God, rely on God. You know that joke about the guy is dating a girl and they finally decide to um, get married so she brings him home and he goes and meets the in-laws the future in-laws he goes to speak to the potential father-in-law privately anyway after it comes out the father-in-law the, 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 the father of the girl says to the mother of the girl she says so what's your impression what's your impression he says seems like a nice guy 
and uh, and so on. But um, uh, what was exactly what he said? He seems like a nice guy, but he has no plans. He has no idea, and um, and, and he relies on God. Everything is God. So he said, "What happens?" He said, "I asked him. You plan? How do you plan to support my daughter?" He says, "I believe in God." God will take care of everything. I'm going to study Torah, but God will take care. How about the wedding? How do you plan to make a wedding? You know, we'll help. He says, God will provide. So he says to his wife, he says, so the good news is, the bad news is he has no plans. The good news is he thinks I'm God. You know? <laughs> That's how he took it. And anyway, I didn't say that on the radio. My point is, I said, so you think God is some cop, some crutch, and so on. I said, no, believing in God is very difficult. Because you have to then reconcile good and evil. You don't know God is the cop out. Because you don't have to reconcile anything. Why should you even be sleep? Why should you be bothered at night? There's no justice. There's no good. That means, I mean, I got my point across. So my point is that faith is not some blind acceptance of a higher power. You know what faith is? Moses was a man of faith. When the Jews built the golden calf, you know what Moses did? He didn't just say, okay, God, you're right. Bad people, let's kill them all. He went up, marched up on the mountain and refused to, to, to take no for an answer. He wanted forgiveness. Faith is an active attitude. It's not the absence of reason. It's beyond reason. I have a doctor I know. He's a very nice guy. He calls himself an atheist. He decided he's going to research and conquer two diseases. I don't even remember their name. Obscure diseases. In his lifetime, that's what he wants to do. So I say to him, how are you so sure you're going to Conquer these diseases. Maybe they're incurable. He says, no, they're absolutely curable. And I keep fighting with him. I have a point to make. He says, he says no. I said, how do you know? How are you so absolute? We live in a relative world. Nothing is absolute. Absolutely, every, every illness can be conquered. So I tell him, you're the biggest fanatic I know. It's, you just don't call it God. You call it medicine. In other words, the idea that you have a total commitment to something is something that's not necessarily rational. Because rational mind should always tell you there's risks. Let's say you go into business with someone. No one's going to say, I absolutely believe my partner is going to be perfect for me. No, a smart businessman says, it seems like a good match. There's risks. He may end up being a real bastard. He may not end up working out. But it's a calculated risk. The type of ability to be able to say, no, I totally believe in goodness. And I will fight a bitter fight, unwavering belief in the love I have for people, or the love I have for my family, that is not a purely rational state. It's not irrational, but it's rationale com- coupled with a very strong commitment. What the Jewish people always knew was that no matter what happens in life, even when things don't work out and seemingly God forsake, for, forsook us, forsook, forsaked us, whatever the word, forsook us, no. You get the idea. That even then, we will never give up our commitment to goodness. And it sounds irrational. It sounds like if God is bad to us, or God has allowed bad things to happen to a good person, it would seem you'd be reciprocal. You know what? You treated me badly, I'm going to treat you badly. Good people never say that. Not because they're weak, because they are not go- I'm, not going to, I'm not going to compromise my standards because you did something to me that was so horrible. <coughs> so the final point I want to make in this regard is that that in a strange way, faith does not mean accepting. That's why when we see someone, God forbid, in the hospital, we don't just say, hey, God decreed it, let's accept it, besimcha, with joy. We don't say that. We make mishabeirachs and we pray and we beg and beseech. We try to fight with God. How is that an ma- pr- act of faith? Because faith is not a passive acceptance. It's a partnership. God, you created us. You told us to fight for goodness. We're fighting for goodness. And we want you to fight with us as well. And even when it doesn't seem, seem, uh, seem positive, we'll still fight for it. That is the ultimate point. I don't know if you heard, I think the first night I spoke about that with that with Elie Wiesel exchange when the Jews would march to the, concentra- to the gas chambers. When they were declaring an imam in or saying Kaddish or Shema, even the hard, in the darkness of the abyss of the Holocaust, it wasn't a denial or escapism or just, okay, God will take... No, it wasn't that. It was declaring, you're not going to destroy our dignity. We'll never stop believing in goodness. They say there was this, this, this Nazi guard, real horrible. Well, they're all horrible. And he pointed, he was about to kill a Jew. 
And the Jew asked, can I give me a minute to say my last prayers? Okay. So he starts whispering his prayers. And the Nazi guard gets all upset and says, what are you saying exactly? He says, I'm thanking my God. He says, what are you thanking your God for? You're a miserable Jew. I'm about to shoot you at my mercy. Where's your God? So he says, I'm thanking my God that he didn't create me like you. That's they tell the story. It's an unbelievable story. In other words, at that point, you would think the person could have, the Jew could have completely surrendered, angry, and turned into a Nazi. No, you're not going to become Nazis. And we're not going to give up on goodness. I'm thanking my God he didn't create me like you. That's a, a beautiful statement. That, again, does not mean we turn the other cheek, that we ignore injustice. When we need to go to war, we go to war. We're not warriors, and we're not defined by our suffering. I can tell you, of the thousands of people I personally have counseled, advised, spoken with, friends, families, strangers, the key to everything is trying to give, infuse in people the confidence that no matter what happens to you, does not shape you. That's the most important thing in my mind, because as long as they think that they are defined by what happened to them, very hard to get out of the way. In other words, if they were abused, and I'm not justifying the abuse. I'm not in any way justifying what the perpetrator did is a crime that needs to be account- they need to be accountable for. But you don't want to be their victim. And the key is to free a person's spirit from what their experiences happened. And when I say that, I mean that, that, that and then ultimately, when you're faced or, you're, or you have people, friends or others that are faced with real suffering, that's what you want to teach them. Not that the suffering was, you don't minimize it. You don't say it's nothing. You're you're silent because of the awesomeness of the mystery of it. But at the same time, what you want to do is empower them and say, you suffer greatly and I'll I'll never be able to understand where you're you're going on in your heart. But you also have greater strengths than you can imagine and you can become a greater person. And it's not about, it's not patronizing, it's actually discovering that deeper truth inside each one of us. So this, would, this wouldn't work with every circumstance, but I, I found for, you know, when maybe I've suffered in the past with some people who coach me, that if Hashem didn't care about me, I wouldn't have any suffering. That Hashem is not ignoring me, He's looking out for me, that means Hashem loves me, and He's giving me additional challenges. So some people that... Sometimes, uh, sometimes, not, not all circumstances. Yeah, I also work. think there's stages. You know, when we, when a person, God forbid, says Shiva, there's a different stage the first three days and the next four days and the 30 days in a year. In the early stages, the most important thing is support, love, empathy. There's no, the discussions are, are, are really not beneficial at that point. Because most people who are really suffering cannot even really sit so I've, had, I've had that on the rece- I felt that on the receiving end and it, it did help me sometimes okay okay Listen, yeah. I, I will never obviously uh, say if something works for some people of course you go with it so I can I'm just that working in all circumstances okay it could be yeah that yeah. Hashem loves you and that's why this happened to you well, I find hard to say it to people to be honest yeah. Because, you know, they'll say, many people say, if he loves me so much, why did he make sure it didn't happen to me? You know? I mean, and I don't want to go into a debate about this topic, but I hear you. I, uh, there's no question, I think it's a good point that you're making. There's no one size that fits all. There's no question. Everybody's different. Everybody's different. I didn't ask the question when my father passed away, why, why it happened. It didn't, that was not what, it just was a, happened to be a tremendous trauma for me. I didn't ask why that for me. But the, the question why will definitely happen in uh, especially real tragedies, premature deaths, you know, accidents or, or other, even this whole COVID thing where people couldn't even grieve properly. You know, what are you saying? Well, I think that um, the outcome of the suffering, if we are not victims, is a certain a heightened awareness that we don't have when we just go through that um, tunnel. Absolutely, but you know that. Uh, but usually, you want people to come to that on their own. It's hard to tell them that. Well, but a lot of a lot of us don't. So I see people when I counsel them that once, and you you know, when the five stages are over and there is a certain amount of acceptance, 
then they are in a place where they, they themselves, not because I tell them that, but they start to look at their level, higher level of awareness. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is what happens. There's no question yeah. about it. And that they also have sensitivity to these matters that others don't have. Yeah. To themselves and others, for sure. Compassion, for sure. empathy. Look, the main thing I want to say is that we should only have simchas and good news in a revealed way. And we shouldn't need talks like this to explain or not explain or... And uh, we should all have simchas in our families. Amen. Forever and ever. Go ahead, yeah. What did he say? I heard them. That's a good point. Very good. Thank you. Anyway, we should be Simon Betoyev, they say. We conclude with good things and have a very good day.